Okay, this is uh, Dr. Abraham Weisfeld here. I'm a graduate of the University of Quebec at Montreal in political science department. And I want to introduce you to two uh, speakers, one representing the Palestine struggle for liberation from the Zionist state and Steve Struggle, Black Panther of the United States struggle for the Black nation's liberation from uh, white supremacism. This is unprecedented. I think that we've uh, never had, in effect, a conference of this nature. And I think that the viewers uh, should appreciate you know, the significance of this meeting here, because we're now talking about uh, international struggles, inter-national, between the various nations we are struggling together in solidarity against white supremacism, which is essentially what Zionism is, and the United States of America, which is an unofficial state <clears throat> hoisted uh, on the uh, genocide of the uh, First Nations, who only uh, comprise two and a half percent of the population now. So we're dealing with you know very difficult uh, struggles, and uh, struggles which we know uh, for which we will succeed, because one, it is logical, and two, we have the sol solidarity of the overwhelming majority of the people in the world. And we can see the uh, third world struggles uh, becoming more and more successful. Now BRICS is uh, exploding, you know, like in terms of membership and in terms of uh, uh, intercommerce uh, so that they don't uh, end up uh, doing what's called unequal exchange, like Samir Amin, the Egyptian uh, uh, economist, you know, was writing about. Now we're talking about, you know, developing socialism on the basis of socialist principles, not exploitation. So um, I invite each of you to in introduce yourselves as well now. And uh, we have a special guest today, who's Ahmad, who I know for 20, 30 years, since uh, 1980 or 1979. Try 40, try 40 years. 40 years, okay. <laughs> 1982. Great. Okay, you know, you once explained to me, you know, like how the Zionists ripped off the Palestinians, you know, in terms of the land. And it was in, utterly amazing to me you know, to hear all the different levels at which, you know, land has been stolen from the Palestinians, like about five different, you know, categories of land. I wonder if you could explain this to the general public for us. Well, uh, my name is uh, Ahmed. I'm Palestinian from uh, Palestine. I live in Canada right now. And... <clears throat> The way the method, uh, the Zionist state uh, or the pre-Zionist state who in collaboration with the British uh, prior 1948 worked, they continue doing until now. So it's the same method. Uh, the, the land in Palestine, it was made of a different category. First category is the so-called state-owned land, which was the British, uh, the the British inherited, quote unquote, from the Ottoman occupation. And that was uh, a good bulk of the land. From that, from this uh, um, ownership, they passed this ownership to the Zionist uh, organization. It's called the Karen Kemet, or the Land of Israel, uh, uh, land of Israel uh, uh, Administration. So that's one way of of uh, stealing the land. There's a second uh, category, which called uh, it's uh, Masha land, which is a land belong to a, a group of of uh, villages, which is uh, like grazed land for the village or the few villages. It's it's primarily owned by those villages, but it's not specifically to one person. It's kind of communal land for those uh, villages. So those lands, uh, the British used to come, and uh, now the Zionists, put their hand on it, say, we're gonna use this for common use, for the common good use. So uh, after a few months, few years, then this land would be transferred to the Zionist organization. Same thing, what's going on now on the West Bank. The same method, actually the Zionists on the West Bank since 1967, uh, have been using the same British rule or laws. It's called the emergency laws, 
which is exactly the same rules that the British used to use against the Palestinians pre-1948. So those these big parcels of land will eventually, you know, like uh, to the to the Zionist uh, settlement or out, outpost or a military uh, a military outpost. Or sometimes they put their hand on those lands and say, this is for the green area. We're going to have it a greenery or a natural reserve. But to learn later, this this land, you know, it become a, a, a land belong to the to a Zionist settlement. This is one thing. There's another uh, uh, parcels of land, which called the, the family communal land. It's like it's a, a big land of piece of land inherited by one family. Let's say my my clan owns uh, let's say twenty or thirty or forty acres of land. It's the clan, my clan, which is not specifically to one person. So this big parcel of land, the Zionist and the British, uh, use the same thing, the same method. We gotta use this for the common good. Or a greenery, or natural reserve, etc. You know, and to learn later on, this has been slowly but surely moved to the new to the colonists, uh, the European colonists uh, who come to Palestine. Then, <clears throat> then there's uh, the private land, privately owned land, which is uh, basically it's owned by a person who has his his or her own deed to that piece of land. Usually what they do is they, when the, usually most of those lands are adjacent to the, 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 the other three parcels of land. So they said, well, because this is, uh, this land is adjacent to the, will be publicly owned for the common good land, we have to confiscate it. And we're willing to give you some money for it. Of course, the Palestinians refuse to take money for that. So they usually they, they issue a, what do you call it, a military order to confiscate that land, and that land become or eventually to to the part of the to that part of land, which eventually turned to a settlement or outpost or military uh, base. That's how it works. How this? How they've been doing it, and of course, there's uh, other uh, methods they use uh, by uh, the you know real estate agents who are collaborating with the Israelis, especially in Jerusalem, in the old city of Jerusalem, or around the Palestinian land of Jerusalem, which is uh, a, a Palestinian. You know, collaborator, he comes to me and he said, oh, now you see you have a parcel of land or that uh, house or that apartment. Would you like to sell it? And I have good buyer. And who's your buyer? Oh, no, no, is this so-and-so a Palestinian guy or something, you know? So uh, it, it happened. Some some people, yeah, well, we'll, we'll uh, I'll give it to you. And he will eventually buy it of you, that uh, real estate agent who is actually collaborator, then he in turn passed along to the settlers. So these are the five methods the Zionists have been doing since 1917, okay, uh, of the Palestinian land. Yeah. I have, mind you, the first two big parts, the, big, the two methods or two parcels of land are the biggest parcels of land in Palestine. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yes, in 1917, it was General Allenby who walked into uh, Jerusalem and proclaimed that this was the last crusade, as if, you know, it was a permanent crusade. And exactly. that means the Zionists are crusaders. <laughs> That's true. They are. That's they true. are. They are. They yeah. are by all means. They are crusaders when it comes to economically and colonization. They are part of that uh, bigger scheme of, of, of crusades. Yeah. Otherwise known as Western imperialism. Yeah. It's a collective. Yeah. There's another uh, sort of area of uh, land confiscation. I did an interview with a Palestinian man whose name is Jafar in Jerusalem one time, in which you know his home in um, in an area called Sheikh Jarrah. I think I don't know the pronunciation. Sheikh, pronounce it. Sheikh Jarrah. Sheikh Jarrah. Yes, and he was living there since '67, 
because you know and it uh, previously and because he was a refugee himself you know from the 1948 area. not 67 they usually 1967 48 uh, 1948 48 yeah could be yeah yeah uh, yeah i think he was living yeah even longer than 67 he was living in this house hmm? and he was a refugee from lud and his home and lands were confiscated to make the airport area mm -hmm. Okay, so he went to the court, you know, even to the Supreme Court, and said, you know, this is my land. And the court said, well, if we give you back this land, we'll have to give back all the lands that were stolen from the Palestinians, and we can't do that. That would be the end of the state. Therefore, you cannot receive your lands back. You know, this is the logic of the Supreme Court. The Supreme of Court, course. you know, that the Netanyahu thinks is too progressive. <laughs> No, no, I, when it comes to major issues with, with for colonization of the Palestinian lands and the major crimes against the Palestinian people, the uh, Supreme Court always have its rubber stamp to these crimes. Mm. Sometimes they do little token things that, you know, make uh, it's like uh, putting, putting some cosmetics to the Zionist uh, ugly image mm. of Crime, say, oh, look at us! We 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 return this part of land to uh, so and so. You see, mm. so uh, even that, even this this token of 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 cosmetism by this Supreme Court uh, land is not is is not good enough for uh, Netanyahu. He has to keep. Yeah. No, yeah. all that. Yeah, he has to have complete control. Wow. Oh. Okay, he calls it a democratic dictatorship. <laughs> well, you know. But, you know, uh, Jafar, he was living in this house that had previously been uh, lived in by a Jewish Palestinian, okay, who fled during the war to uh, to what became 48, uh, you know, the 48 territories of Palestine. So he, the courts, you know, say that the uh, land and the house, you know, has to be returned to a Jewish owner. But when it comes to his land and his house, it's not being returned. So he's evicted from this house that he's been living in since 48. And where's he supposed to go? You know, he can't go back to his own, you know, and, and this is another way in which land is confiscated uh, from uh, the Palestinians. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Yeah. That's that's uh, it's a uh, bring me back to the the uh, squatters, the colonialist squatters inside Al Khalil, which is called Hebrew. Which they claim that these these uh, properties inside the old city of Al Khalil, which yeah. is called Hebron, yeah. it belonged to Jews. But uh, those Jews who were there, okay, their offsprings who live now in, in so-called Tel Aviv and everywhere else, they actually wrote a letter to the Supreme Court of Israel said, we we are the rightful owners of this land, these uh, places, and we don't want them. These are belong to the Palestinians. Whereas mm -hmm. the white, the white colonists, okay, who came from all European white colonists mostly, said, oh, because we are Jews, they were Jews, therefore it's ours. So this is a, another, exactly the same uh, illogic, logic of illogic, I call it. Right. So the, the rightful owners, they, they said, we don't want this uh, properties because we got other properties. And those people who took over these properties inside Hebron, Al-Khalil, okay, they don't represent us. They have no linkage, no lineage to us. Wow. Works for the Zionists. Wow. I've never heard that before, you know. Yes. This is not, yes. uh, you know, revealed, you know, in any sort of the reports of about what's going on in Hebron. They never talk about this. Of course not. Mm. Of course not. We should get copies not. of the letter and reproduce them, you know, and make it. Absolutely. I, I still remember. Actually, actually, uh, to be honest with you, it was published, not the letter. Actually, there was an article by uh, Amir Haas oh, yes. of Haaret. Mentioning that, uh, I, I don't know, it's her or Gideon Levy, one of them, either her or Gideon Levy, who, who mentioned that thing. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. It's it's easily it's easily can we can uh, retrace this information and publish it. Yes. Okay. Now that's one struggle, Palestine, in uh, the struggle in Africa, Steve. I I just saw an announcement today that the uh, 
the Western uh, alliance uh, of African states that are, are aligned with the United States are planning to attack Niger. And they've uh, proclaimed a, a D-Day or something like that. But uh, what do you think is going to happen there? Is your, uh, your microphone is on mute, Steve. So uh, can you give us a... Yes. Yes, yes. Well... I don't really know what's going to happen. This has been a very confusing situation in the sense of the military plans for the the members of ECOWAS. I'm not sure if all of ECOWAS is supporting this. The AU, the African Union, does not support it. And I think that's a critical uh, feature to consider. The African Union whether I like it or not, is like the United Nations or like the EU, the EU of Europe. And when the EU gives a stamp on something, most nations of Europe are going to go, are going to go along with it. The African Union, however, does not appear to have that power or that force over ECOWAS, which is, I now see as a rival organization. That's how I see it now. Hmm. Um, because they have no authority. See, here, see here, here's a problem. As you know, Nigeria has cut the electricity to Niger. So I researched something recently this week about how can Nigeria do this? Under, I mean, yes, it's uh, apparently the electricity is connected to its grid, so they can just cut it off but on what legal basis, and there is none. These sanctions, these D-Days, these documents, these proclamations have no legal basis on any, in any, on any treaty, any agreement, nothing. They simply become judge, jury, and enforcer. So the way I see it, my analysis is that France and potentially the United States have, if this is true, have given Nigeria their tacit approval to do this. Because Nigeria on, and ECOWAS on its own have no right to enter, enter a country, even though they've done it in the past. I think the entire existence of ECOWAS now needs to be challenged. But that is not coming from, at least, I want to see that coming from African workers and intellectuals and um, people in the fields and gov governments. We will just have to see what, what occurs. And I, I don't like to have that as my view. We'll have to wait and see. If they said they're going to invade, I'm going to believe them. If they don't, then we'll see what else they do. That's how I see it. Mm -hmm. Um I, again, another issue is uh, the any kind of military in, in incursion into into Niger helps the Islamists because the Islamists are fighting the Nigerian government. So, therefore, the Nigerian government has to fight now two two enemies at one time, and that's kind of hard to do unless your, our army is ready for that. Right now, they're only fighting one, which is the Islamists. Mm -hmm. So what I'm hoping is that if this is going to occur, right now, my view is, as an outsider, I'm not a military strategist, that Mali and Burkina Faso's army should be in Nigerian territory now. They should be in their territory now, not waiting for any invasion, and, hope, and hopefully they are. And they may have to either... They may have to take up, they, those, all the armies are going to have to figure out how they're going to fight the, the rebels, the so-called rebels or the Islamists and the occupy, the attempted occupiers from uh, Nigeria and ECOWAS. That's my view of the situation. With no electricity, I, I don't understand why this has not become an international crime outrage because when you talk about electricity, you turn off hospitals, turn off re uh, refrigeration, you turn off all kinds of materials that people need for life. 
So that in itself is an act of a crime against humanity and a crime, actually a war, a war crime and an act of war. So we'll, we'll just have to see. I mean, what I had heard was that there was unrest, unrest in Nigeria uh, uh, weeks ago behind their attempt to, uh, their call for an invasion. I don't know if the, if the Nigerian labor movement and political parties are prepared to strike and attempt to overturn their government at this point. Um, I don't know where the demonstrations are around the world. This has been not been handled well quote, by the so-called, to me, by the international community, be the international community of leftists, of progressive, of activists. I've seen very little um, active op opposition. And this is quite disappointing. However, it is what it is. So let's just hope that those of us who are staying on the forward side of history will con con to condemn and condemn any plans for and any actual military occupation. Because it just serves, it just serves the interests of French and U.S. imperialism, as well as a, a, we must now begin to see Nigeria and ECOWAS as a pro-imperialist force. We must see it that way. Even if they don't carry out the threat, the fact that they are calling for it means that they support the domination of the region by foreign imperialists and capitalists, because that's the only reason to invade the country, is that the current rulers don't meet the, don't get the, don't meet the approval of the French and the United States. This is the only reason, because you can negotiate political relationships with the current government. Anything can be negotiated if you just want to give it time. Russia and Ukraine, NATO and NATO and, uh, is fighting Russia in a proxy war, yet there are negotiations going on. Yes, there are. It's behind the scenes. It's, there's no reporting on them. There are negotiations right now going on. So anything can be negotiated if the parties want to negotiate. And as I understand it, the um, Committee for the Salvation of the Fatherland has indicated its willingness to, to, to negotiate. It has called for the re removal of sanctions as a condition. Actually, nothing wrong with that, but that also can be negotiated. So it just seems to me that somebody wants war. Somebody wants bloodshed. Somebody wants violence. That's not the people of, of uh, Niger. They have not called for that. That's been called by for by the imperialists, France, United States, and their and their front men, which is ECOWAS and and Nigeria. That's how I see it right now. Mm. In terms of the strategy, I think there's a you know a big <clears throat> strategic difference between a reformist and a revolutionary approach. You know how to solve these problems. In the case of uh, Palestine, for instance, I find that both the uh, two-state solution proposed, you know, by uh, by the uh, United Nations and by uh, United States, supposedly even Canada, you know, like a proposed, you know, solution of a two-state solution. Then there's, you know, the progressive forces that are calling for a one-state solution, which are basically. Uh, populated by ex-CP Communist Party members, who nonetheless, as far as I'm concerned, have a reformist uh, approach to this, to uh, the liberation of, of Palestinians and, and Palestine, because they ignore the Palestinian refugees. All of a sudden, they've disappeared, you know? <laughs> this is what a reformist, you know, uh, approach does. It accepts the existing conditions of life and attempts to uh, uh, better it under the existing domination of the powers that be in order to achieve a certain degree of popular support, that is, support for their organization. So it's not really a liberation strategy that is being proposed in either case. It is rather a strategy to gain support for their particular party or movement. And this I reject. You know, the right of return of the Palestinian refugees is the starting point, not an end point. Because if it's not the starting point, it'll never be an end point. You know, in a two-state solution, <laughs> oh, you know, Israel 
would not allow an independent, supposedly independent Palestine to bring back the uh, Palestinian refugees because they would insist upon maintaining control over the border with Jordan. <laughs> and they have control of the border with Syria and plus a piece of Syria. And, you know, the rest is controlled, you know, by the airport. So how are the Palestinian refugees supposed to be able to come back even to a supposedly independent Palestine? Wouldn't work. A one-state solution, what does that mean? They say, oh, it's equality, you know, liberal, you know, democracy, in which each resident, you know, would have a vote. Okay, now the Israeli residents, who are about equal to the Palestinian residents, you know, have all the political power, have the economic power, have the military power, and they're not going to give it up. You know, who's going to make them give it up? <laughs> you know, not the Palestinians. They won't have, you know, a countervailing power sufficient to do so. So they're not going to allow for the Palestinian refugees to return, even in the one state solution. So that doesn't work either. You know, those are reformist propositions that I reject. Even even if let's say we there is such thing called two state solution, the Zionist the Zionist state made made it on the on the ground impossible to implement mm -hmm. such mm -hmm. a two state solution. Mm -hmm. Whereas the West Bank is inundated or dotted by over 240 uh, settlements and outposts, okay, all across the West Bank, plus the by, by, uh, by bus roads, et cetera, et cetera, controlling over 60% of the West Bank in it, on it, including East Jerusalem, which is in the heart of the West Bank. Mm. There's over 850,000 colonist quarters mm. on it. So, even if, let's say, okay, the world wants to have that two-state solution on the West Bank from side and Gaza Strip from that side, it's not gonna work. It's not gonna happen. It's 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 like it's like uh, it's a fantasy. It become the Zionist uh, consecutive Israeli government mm -hmm. made such proposal a fantasy. So they just uh, give us a, 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 a lip service. Oh, we want to have a two-state solution. It's not going to happen. One state solution is not going to happen. There's a big loss. Uh, most of the Zionists it, it reject such equality, such one state solution, even if we want to go with that. So the whole thing is just only it's a, it's a charade. It's a, it's a facade of a, an actual persisting issue. We have a colonist, Western-style, a squatter uh, state has to go no, no matter what it has to go there's no solution it's the same thing as we talking about we had uh, with the Rhodesia South Africa uh, same thing it, the system has to be dismantled and thrown in the garbage to start all over again you cannot and I, I agree with you there will be no peace. There will be no any solution without the the starting point, the rehabilitation of Palestinian refugees back to their land, homes, and fields. Mm. But back to what uh, up to the Niger issue, I quick. This morning I was reading that Burkina Faso and Mali put their uh, <clears throat> air force in uh, to the. Uh, to support and be ready to support any uh, uh, to, to support and protect Niger from any attack. So that's what I don't know how how was serious is that, but this is what I read. It was on Russia today. Mm. Sorry. Very good. Uh, the same thing with respect to uh, the uh, black struggle in the United States. It seems to me, you know, that the difference between a reformist and a revolutionary strategy is that. Uh, the reformists are promoting assimilation, basically integration, they call it, you know, but it's really yep. assimilation in which you're supposed yes. to, you know, lose your black identity and be, you know, like colorblind. You know, Reagan talked about being yes. colorblind, you know, yes. because everybody's. I call to, it, you know, I call it the Oreo syndrome. Be black from the outside and be white from the inside. I call it the Oreo syndrome. <laughs> yes, the Oreo syndrome. Yeah. So, you know, like integration, yeah, for sure, yeah. But you know, as what? You know, as the poorest paid worker mm -hmm. in the whole system. You know, as yep. the, as the uh, lower class of the working class. You know, as the lumpen yes. proletariat. You know, this is what they're offering as integration. 
Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and 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 there is no there is no solution to end the lower class status within the integration. Yeah. That's why it's fake. Yeah. In the same in the, but but look at the native people. Mm. There is no integration for the native people. No, there is not. Well, we you can have control over some land. Let's look at the Navajo Nation. Mm. Navajo Nation is between, I want to say, Colorado, Arizona, uh, New Mexico, um, and there's no water on the res. No, it's just like it's well, what okay. It's very similar to the Palestinians. Hmm. There is no solution that is a reformist solution that enables the rights of the oppressed to regain their initial status as human beings deserving of political, economic, social, and cultural um, integrity. I've been thinking about this recently. To me, the only real race in the United States, I mean, and a proposal could be the Native nations are now the rulers of the United States. The Native nations now running the United States. The United States Congress doesn't exist. The Senate doesn't exist. The Native nations, in alliance with the Black, the Black nation, run the United States. They are now the rulers. Why? Because of history. The only way to make, only way to make it equal is for those who were, who, who's, on whose basis the land was stolen and built are now the rulers. Now, of course, that's not going to happen either, like my brother was saying in Palestine. That's not going to happen because basically the United States government would never have it. Now, unfortunately, many whites would never, many whites would never accept that. What? A black man that's in charge of me because of what happened to him and her and slavery and Jim Crow. What an, an Indian is an Indian in charge of me because we stole their land. But it would have to have some kind of radical redistribution of power. And that's why the integration approach doesn't work. There's no right, you are just a part of the system now. And because you are a black, even if you're even if you are Oprah Winfrey, even if you are uh, um, Barack Obama, even if you were a high, a high, um, very wealthy and high appraising, high status African American, there is no, there are no Native people who are even equal to that status. It's just the tribal governments. I'm trying to show you how unequal it is among even between African American Natives and 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 the, the overall white society. So all of these. Integration proposals are dead on arrival when it comes to real power and integrity and a solution towards liberation. They just don't work. Mm. And that's why I'm very happy to have to have Amen on the program because he's he's showing a very a very a mirrors a mirrored situation in Palestine. This is why this is why it's a good conversation, and that's why I say to African Americans we have to see Palestinians not only as our allies, but as someone we can learn from historically. Because the occupation of Palestine, to me, is the same as the occupation of North America. Mm. There may be some historical differences, but it's the same concept. We want the land. Whoever's there has just got to go. Oh, you won't leave. We can't kill you. Well, let's just do something with you. I don't know. We'll give you whatever. I think it's very similar. That's why I'm very honored to have this conversation with him. Because we need this alliance of a sharing, studying each other's history, studying each other's political orientation, studying each other's defeats, studying each other's ideas for liberation. I think that we can learn from each other. We have to do this. Hmm. We have to, because there's no other, to me, no other struggle on the planet that's so similar. They're so similar. And the money goes from the United States to Israel. That shows you that they're similar. Anywhere the United States spends this money to keep everybody oppressed, those oppressed people should learn from each other. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Well, oh. it's a it's a long, hard struggle. Yes. But, it is. Uh, it has to be. It has to be. Uh, <clears throat> any struggle has to address uh, two things, in my opinion: social, economical issues to the oppressed people, 
and, and their uh, cultural independence. If these two are not met, there will be no no solution. It will be just only cosmetics, mm -hmm. and just uh, a game of charade and game of uh, just wasting time, like the reformist uh, ideology, which mm -hmm. is actually it's a, it's a it's an ideology make feel good ideology, but Basically, it doesn't lift the black nation or anybody oppressed in the world from where they are at. It's just a waste of time. And I agree with you. It has to be a real social, economical, and cultural independence in order to achieve uh, independence. Right. We don't have much time left, actually. <clears throat> but I think in general, we can uh, see that when the third world says no, and when the fourth world nationalities, you know, within the first world say no, then the first world will fall. You know, they're entirely dependent upon the exploitation of the rest of the world. And if they can't get away with it, then they're going to come apart because they don't have anything on their own, you know, to sustain themselves because they're an exploitative capitalist system, which can only exist on the misery of others. And when the right. others, you know, say no, then that's the end of the game. Okay, so I think that we've come to the end of our time for this week, and uh, we should do this. Uh, we should continue on this basis, uh, you know, in the following week. So, uh, thank you, thank you. Yes, Good. so we will uh, see you all again uh, in uh, the next week's uh, 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 dis uh, uh, dissemination. What do we call this? You know, what is this broadcast? We were broadcasting to the world. Yes. So until Congress, next week. Conversation. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, and uh, Monday I'll have I'll have news of what my court case is doing, you know, from the Monday first hearing. Mm. I'll report on that okay. next week. Good luck okay. with that. See you then. Okay, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye.